Hello and welcome to yet another weekly walk here with the Central Park Conservancy. My name is Desiree and today we're going to be getting into winterized Bethesda Terrace here on January 25th, 2023. It is very nice to see you all on this cold day in New York, um, but hopefully you could warm up with us grab a cup of tea or perhaps some hot chocolate and enjoy this little humble weekly walk we have going on for y'all. We have had a little bit of a running theme of winter and snowy escapades in our last most recent weekly walks and we are gonna continue that theme today. So again, stay tuned and hopefully could relax and enjoy this nice scenic weekly walk that we have here for you today. Um, of course, we always have our Zoom housekeeping on for you all, which includes the Q and A feature to put any and all of your questions. As I have my car, as I have my colleague Carla on the back end, that will be answering any and all questions for using the Q and A feature, the chat feature to say how you're doing and where you're from. And also we have the live transcript feature on the bottom if you would like that as well. And of course, we at the Central Park Conservancy, our mission is to always preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life for the enjoyment and well-being for all. So definitely enjoy the weekly walk that we have in store for you today. Um, today, our weekly walk is pretty short, pretty humble, but that means that it would be very easy for you to complete this same exact route for yourselves the next time you guys visit Central Park. So we're going to be starting, of course, at East 72nd Street, also known as Inventors Gates, and we're going to be ending at, of course, Bethesda Fountain and Bethesda Terrace, the heart of the park, one of our most favorite places here at the Conservancy. So Adventures Gate is one of our most favorite places to start in the park just because there's just so much going on. There's a lot of landmarks and sites at this area of Central Park at East 72nd Street. So with that, let's get into it right at Adventures Gate. And we could already have our first location in our sites. And our first location for today is gonna to be none other than the Samuel F. B. Morse statue. Right here, sitting at Inventors Gate. Of course, the Morse statue is dedicated to Samuel F. B. Morse, who was the creator of the telegraph as well as Morse code. He also holds a telegraph beside him in this very statue. And the statue was dedicated in 1871 to commemorate his 80th birthday in which he is the only living person to have a statue commemorated to him in Central Park because um, he was 80 when the statue was actually commemorated. Yes, he's the only living person because the other figure we had that had a statue dedicated to them while they were living was of course Balto, but it would be shortly after 1871 where they would make more rules and regulations for um, memorials and statues that could be commemorated in the park. And after that, essentially, you would have to be no longer alive to have a statue commemorated in Central Park. So that's your first site and your first fun fact for today. Um, and just right across the street of East 72nd Street and Morris, we have one of our volunteer booths. So the next time you stop in Central Park, definitely stop by any of our volunteer booths, because of course, all of our volunteers here at the Conservancy are a wealth of knowledge. And I was, as I was making my way down the path, letting, of course, our friends with the horses and carriages pass in front of me as I look both ways, we are slowly but surely approaching our next stop, as we could see him on the horizon. We are approaching one of the most picturesque areas of Central Park, um, especially during certain seasons. And of course, we could see some people taking this opportune hill right here. Um, it's as it's very popular, but of course, what I'm talking about is the Pilgrim Hill statue or the Pilgrim Monument. The Pilgrim on top of Pilgrim Hill is a great scenic picnic spot, of course, in the spring, as it also is going to be covered with 
some Yoshino cherry trees right behind the pilgrim here in the spring. So definitely check them out. Um, they beautifully blossom and add a very scenic vibe to it in the spring, which is one of the reasons why it's such a nice place to picnic. Also being right on top of the hill, we got some nice views, but that's not the only season, only season where Pilgrim Hill is so picturesque as in the winter time, it is one of the most popular places to go sledding. Whenever there is snow or anything like that in the park, many people, young and old, of all types um, like to come here and sled right down Pilgrim Hill with the Pilgrim saying hi to them as they make their journey. And just to get a little bit of a closer up look of this plaque here, we can see that essentially the statue was commemorated in 1879 to commemorate the first Pilgrims that were landing on Filmic Rock in Massachusetts. And that is what it is talking about here. Essentially, the pilgrim was made encapsulate. It was made by John Quincy Adams Ward, and it was to encapsulate the perfect Puritan man. As he stands proudly with his axe, it was to commemorate not only the pilgrims reaching Plymouth Rock, but also just to show the spirit of a Puritan man, as during these times they were trying to integrate. Puritans more into American culture. Um, so that's gonna be one of the reasons we see this Puritan man. So also a pilgrim standing so proudly on top of this statue on Pilgrim Hill. And of course, it wouldn't be as iconic and scenic as it is today without this beautiful statue right on top of this picturesque hill. So definitely check out Pilgrim Hill if you have the chance on your next visit. All right, our next stop is not too far away at all. We're gonna be, of course, slowly and carefully crossing the street as we look both ways to zoom over to our next site of the day. We could see her right here as we are right by the entrance of Bumsy Playfield. But yes, our next stop is indeed gonna be another sculpture looking very different from the first two that we actually saw. And this sculpture is gonna be none other than the Mother Goose statue. Again, looking very different as she uses different materials from the sculptures we just saw. Getting a little bit of a closer look here, we can see the statue in all her glory. We can see the beautiful granite that was used to make this beautiful recognizable character. Essentially, Mother Goose is a very recognizable character from many children's storybooks, nursery rhymes, and fairy tales. Although the character did originate from European literature, specifically French literature, as French was the first time we would have seen Mother Goose written, it was in French, and then later translated into English. She is a very beloved storybook character in many different literatures. Um, as we can see, it looks like that she's on top of a cloud as well as if we look even closer on top of a goose itself. So we can see the goose's head right on top here, beautifully carved in this granite as the wings wrap around either side. Now there are actually many different finer details to see on closer inspection of the statue. So let's take a closer look. So if we do take a closer look, we are seeing some of these more finer details the wings wrapped around. But essentially, this entire statue is gonna have different references to different Mother Goose nursery rhymes. This statue in particular has references to Humpty Dumpty, Old King Cole, Mother Hubbard, Little Jack Homer, and Mary and her little lamb. So perhaps one of these, this carving that we can see right here of a little child is definitely referencing one of these different nursery rhymes. I have previously mentioned. Um, let's take a little bit of a look at the back of this Mother Goose statue. A lot more of an easily recognizable, easily to view scene. And although I'm not sure the specific nursery rhyme this little scene is entailing, it looks like a king of some sort, and they're about to eat something. Um, perhaps we can assume maybe it's referencing. Old King Cole, or maybe Little Jack Homer. So that, 
that is something very fun and interesting as every single side is referencing a different mother goose nursery rhyme. And over here is a character that I don't think needs much of an introduction, but he will get one anyway. Essentially, this is going to be the carving of Humpty Dumpty himself. And in case you don't know the story of Humpty Dumpty, it goes like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So it's about an egg who had a very bad fall and had to get help from his community. So we do see a little sneaky reference to Humpty Dumpty right there. And the front of the Mother Goose statue is definitely my personal favorite part, as I think it's the most easily viewable and seeable carvings. But we can see all these intricate carvings right up here. You can see the other side of the goose and the beautiful goose hen. Up here, we are seeing a panther or a wild cat of some sort. Very beautiful and very nice. And down here, we are seeing what looks like a little girl with some animals trailing right behind her, which really leads me to believe that this carving is gonna be in reference to Mary and her little lambs. We can see Mary here carved out. You can see her dress and her beautiful shoes right here and her little lambs very close behind, not too far at all. And if we go slightly behind the Mother Goose statue, we're gonna be directly right at Rumsey Playfield. Um, it's very appropriate that the Mother Goose statue is right in front of Rumsey Playfield as this whole area is intended as a children's play space. Um, we are seeing two other different statues called the Snow Babies, who are also right at the entrance of Rumsey Playfield. And they're called the Snow Babies because essentially these statues are depicting two children who are about to have a snowball fight. And if we take a closer look at the plaque, we can see that it reads in memory of Mary Harriman Rumsey, who's going to be the person who this field is dedicated towards. It says, Mary Harriman Rumsey, a gracious citizen who gladly gave her means and herself for the health and happiness of little children making this entire area um, dedicated to children. As Rumsey Playfield is a playground of some sort, not the playgrounds that we would be thinking about in the 21st century with play structures, but just a huge area for kids to run around in. And with that, we're gonna take one last beautiful glimpse at this intricate Mother Goose statue, very unique, covered in granite. And we're gonna make our way to our next destination, and that's going to be towards the mall. All right, so as I was making my way down this path towards the mall, I did happen upon a friendly furry friend, the wildlife of Central Park, of course, and this is just, um, of course, an American gray squirrel, a Northeast American gray squirrel, as he chomps down on an acorn. This is just a great reminder to remind you to never feed any of the wildlife in Central Park. Do not feed the wildlife in Central Park as it creates lots of different problems and different diseases within the animals. Because if you are giving them human food, they are going to be malnourished and they will just pass down the malnourished and diseases to the next generation, which will lead us to have generations of animals that aren't properly nourished and have lots of sicknesses and illnesses. So just a reminder to never feed any of the wildlife in Central Park and let wildlife be wild. Thank you so much. And as I continue down my merry way towards the mall, which is gonna be the only, the formal area of Central Park and the only straight path in Central Park, looking very picturesque as it always is with some beautiful street performers we're gonna make a little stop at the Nomberg Band Show that was dedicated in 1927. It has been a source for music in the park for many different years. As music in the park has been very, um, a staple, have, having Sunday concerts, free Sunday concerts in the park since the um, late 1800s, we still like to keep up the tradition of music in Central Park today with, um, now, instead of having concerts here at the Nomberg Van Shell, we do have them right behind the Van Shell, which is actually where we just came from. So where we just came from 
one of the Rumsey play fields where we now have summer stage at. So at first, at most times in the year is an area for children to play around. But during the summertime, we do have our famous summer stage there. So definitely next time you're visiting in the summer, check out any of those free summer stage clubs. Um, people probably don't realize how close a lot of these different monuments are to one another. But everything is extremely close together in this area of Central Park because it is the formal area of Central Park. Please report meet up. And of course, that is going to be Bethesda Terrace. So of course, this terrace forms art and architecture together because although it is a staple of some beautiful arts, it has nature as a prevalent theme. If we take a closer look at these two banisters on either side, these two pillars on either side, um, we can see that they have different scenes on each side. So essentially on these two pillars, it's supposed to represent day and night. This pillar is supposed to represent a daytime scene with this beautiful cottage as seen here. And this is supposed to represent the nighttime scene with a book being illuminated by this beautiful oil lamp. Um, don't forget about that very sneaky carving on the side that is going to be the witch who is also depicting nighttime. So definitely, make sure you are taking a closer look and examining these sandstone carvings that were made by the successor um, of Calvert Box that's gonna be Jacob Raymond as they tell so many different stories and they're just very beautiful to look at. And as we come to the middle bits, that is the terrace, one of the most famous things about this terrace is its bathrooms as right now they are closed. So essentially, there are bathrooms on either side of this staircase, but they are closed for the season. Um, and that is gonna be for a very important reason. Um, throughout Central Park, there are about 18 restrooms in total. And during the cold months, um, there are only four bathrooms that actually close for the season. And Bethesda Terrace is gonna be one of them. And essentially it's gonna open back up in late March. So from late November is when it closed to we're gonna open back up in late March um, is gonna be one of the reasons why Bethesda Terrace gets winterized. Essentially, winterized is just a term we use here at Central Park to relate to the infrastructure of it since we turn off certain features of the park during the winter. And these bathrooms is going to be one of those things. Um, we are quickly approaching our final area for this walk, of course, the ever so beautiful Angel of the Waters Fountain. Now, essentially our winterized Bethesda Terrace is going to be, and Bethesda Fountain, is going to be a terrace and a fountain that has no water. So essentially this statue that's also the angel of the waters fountain is also turned off for the season. Um, and these are gonna be for infrastructure reasons. So essentially we don't want any pipes to break or freeze during these really extremely cold temperatures um, as that would cause lots of infrastructure problems and damage. And also if we could imagine if the Angel of the Waters Fountain did get covered in ice, it also could be detrimental to her. Because what if a piece breaks off and causes damage to the statues themselves? So these are gonna be some of the reasons why we actually turn off the water from late November to, to late March. So we don't want any harm to come to, to the terrace and infrastructurally, um, we cannot have on the water during the winter time as we don't have the infrastructure to support the pipes and things of that nature from freezing over or anything like that. So these are gonna be the main reasons why the water is turned off um, during these times of year. I do know that other parks have things that allow the fountain to be on during the winter, but Central Park does actually not have those things. And they also predate most of the other parks around the city. But it does give us a better look at these statues and the intricate detail these bronze carvings actually have. 
directly underneath the angel of the waters are going to be these three beautiful cherubs that are supposed to sim symbolize health, purity, and temperance. Health, purity, peace, and temperance. That's what these cherubs are supposed to symbolize as the entire fountain is going to be a tribute to water. The fountain was made by Emma Stevens, the first woman to accept a public arts commission in New York City, and was commemorated to the Croton Aqueduct system that actually got to New York a couple years before Central Park's opening. So these four cherubs down here are actually representing the purity and the health of the water that's gonna come from Bethesda Fountain. And of course, we can see the beautiful angel of the waters on top, and we get a very closer look at her details as well. So Emma Simmons was inspired by the Crone Aqueduct system, as well as many other things. She was also inspired by this biblical verse called the Gospel of John, which depicts an angel that touches a pool of water and actually ends up giving that water healing powers. So what we can see on the top of this fountain is the angel doing just that, touching the water beneath her that would be flowing right beneath her and also perhaps giving it healing powers. And here we're getting a very nice opportune look at the back of the Angel of the Waters, how symmetrical it looks, and also just that stark contrast of the park's features with these sky, sky high, high rises and buildings. Um, no matter how we feel about it, it definitely gives a very stark and interesting contrast to the landscape. And since we are about at the end of our tour, I thought I would launch a little poll for y'all that essentially is just asking, what was the favorite spot that you saw today? As um, this is our last spot that we're gonna be visiting for today, of course. I just wanted to know what was the favorite feature that we actually saw today? And don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you guys hanging because we are gonna see our beautiful Bethesda Terrace. Um, we can see at the bottom where some of the water actually goes in and where the water is supposed to be at the bottom. But we are also going to be able to see it in its beautiful winterized splendor covered in snow. And I'm going to share the results of this poll. Essentially, I asked for the favorite spot today for a weekly walk. I said Pilgrim Hill, Mother Goose, Namburg Bansell, Bethesda Terrace, or Bethesda Fountain. And it seems like our favorite area was the Mother Goose. Oh, no, was the Bethesda Fountain. So Bethesda Fountain, so beloved. We have actually a very many different weekly walks about Bethesda Terrace and Bethesda Fountain. And essentially, um, close second is going to be the Mother Goose statue, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you just learned about today. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you so much for coming on um, yet another one of the Conservancy's weekly walks. We definitely always appreciate you here at the public programs area of the Conservancy. Um, definitely thank you all for again attending yet another brilliant and beautiful weekly walk. I hope everyone is staying safe and warm out there. And yes, I would like you all to stay safe and be well, and we will see you next week. All right. Make sure you take a look at our tours page for any and all upcoming tours. We would love to have you. So stay safe and be well. Until next week, y'all. Goodbye.